All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody over in Red Box. Welcome. So glad you guys are here. Is it nice to have this sunny 90 degree day today? Oh, man. I, I, I like the sun. I'm still into the 70s, though. So, but uh, hey, um, as we talk about uh, this whole idea of being broken, um, for me, there's always a, a personally, there's an illustration of my own life that, that hits me immediately. And that is, uh, when I grew up, some of you, if you're new here, you might not know me. If, you, if you've been here for a while, you, you know a big part of my life is, is uh, sports. And uh, that was my life. My dad was a phys ed teacher. And then he coached football, basketball, and baseball. So that was my life. And as a kid, I mean, it was like just, all I did was play with football cards. We had about seven acres. We had a football field on the left side of the driveway and a baseball diamond on the right side. And I just, I just loved it. In my dream as a kid, I couldn't wait until I finally got to play my first real tackle football game, put on the pads, put on a helmet, hit somebody. Yeah, okay, there's somebody else. I had there's somebody else who knows what I'm talking about. So, uh, so anyway, so I'm in eighth grade. I know we had to wait till eighth grade when back in the, that day before you got to play that, that type of game. And uh, it was, I think it was about the third quarter. It was after halftime, and I was just having a blast. I was in my heyday. And this guy comes coming around the end, and I went around, and I grabbed him to tackle him, and I grabbed him by the jersey, and I pulled him down on top of me. And as I did, everybody else jumped on top, you know, just a big, huge jam pile. And as soon as I laid on the ground, I just knew something was wrong. And I just yelled, get off! You know, the guy whose face was right under mine, his eye got all big, and, and then he, they, one by one, they all jumped off the pile. And uh, as I laid there, I looked over, and my arm went here, and then it went up here, and then it went down here. And then my hand was, I mean, literally, it was an S. And I just, and I literally, the first words out of my mouth were, why me? Because this was my life. And I, and I just, I mean, but it was horrible. Some guy ran over and ripped the home run fence down and got a piece of wood to, you know, stick on my arm. And they, you know, they got me to the hospital. And, and then as I'm sitting in the emergency room, my mom didn't trust emergency technicians at that time. So she made me wait for a personal friend of ours who was an orthopedic surgeon. I laid there for hours. And they pumped me with pain medication, and nothing worked. I tell you, my mom is one tough woman. She didn't care at all. She's like, she just let me lie there in pain. And, uh, and so finally, they came in. You know, they did all the x-rays, all the kinds. They, they, they set my arm, and then they showed me the x-ray. And literally, my, my, the two bones in your arm were like this, and the other two were snapped right in two. Just took it right off and snapped it off. Now, <clears throat> when that happens, that's wrong. <laughs> I mean, I'm laying on the, I mean, immediately, as soon as I brought him down on top of me and I felt the I'm pain, I'm going, this is wrong. <laughs> this is not the way it's supposed to be. And when your arm is snapped in two, it doesn't work. <laughs> you can't do anything with it. You're in amazing pain. And there's something inside of you just, this just knows this has to be fixed. All right, now let's take that to relationships. Mike, I just asked you guys, how many of you have broken relationships? And immediately, we all do. We've all, I mean, if you haven't, that's, that's weird. I'd say, actually, get to know somebody. And uh, if you get to know somebody, you'll be in a broken relationship before too long. Um, it's just hard to be human and be in relationship with, with people. And, but when a relationship that is supposed to be close breaks and there's conflict, it's the same thing. Immediately, you know, this is wrong. I mean, nobody experiences conflict and goes, in, or a broken relationship goes, man, this is awesome. You know, this is great. I really enjoy this. You just, you don't. You know it's wrong. And the other thing that's weird is when your relationship is broken, it doesn't work. And when it's not working, what's wild is you find out that you can't be productive. Even, even life doesn't work. And I, I, would, I would dare to say, all you have to do is look at the world and really, the conflict in the world and the reason they're struggling in the world is because human beings can't get along with each other, because our relationships are broken. But when they're right, I mean, when, you, when you're connected with somebody and you're in sync with each other and you feel one with each other, I mean, there's nothing more joyful. There's nothing more that brings peace to your life, that brings purpose. You feel like you can go make something happen. In fact, I would say, I, I know we're all wired differently, um, but I, I, I would say that there's really nothing more painful than a, than a broken relationship. And that there's nothing more fulfilling when a relationship is in sync. Now, here's what I want to talk to you about today. Is magnify the experience you've had with any human being. 
like I couldn't come up with a number. We'll just, just take this and go with it as far as you want. Magnify that a hundred times when you talk about your relationship with God. Magnify what we need to do as human beings is understand that when our relationship with God is broken and when it's separated, there is, I'm going to show you here in a minute, there is absolutely more pain, more dysfunction, more inability to be who we're really created to be than probably we even know. And on the flip side of that, once that relationship with God is mended, reconciled, brought back together, then there's nothing more fulfilling, more joyful, more satisfying than anything, than really, than having God inside of you. So that's what we're going to talk about today. The title is uh, Divine Relationship and Earthly Divorce. Uh, if you haven't been with us, we're going through 2 Corinthians, and we're talking, our title, our series is all about living in two worlds. The fact that as a human being, we live in two worlds. We have an earthly existence, but at the same time, there's a spiritual, eternal world that we're engaged in right now while we live, and we're trying to figure out how to do that. I feel like that's what it means to have a relationship with God, is to know how to live in this world and also to have him in our lives as well. And I, I just want to say, the separation from, from God, you guys, is literally, I, th I believe it's separation from life. That's what the Bible teaches us. Jesus said, I am the life. God is the one who created us. And when we're not connected to him, we lose life. In fact, uh, one of the illustrations the Bible uses in John 15, he talks about the vine and the branches. And uh, uh, in our backyard, uh, we are blessed when we bought our home. Uh, the people there had planted uh, grapes uh, all around our backyard. It's just crazy grapes. If anybody wants grapes this fall, I mean, we can't even, like, get close to eating them all. It's just crazy. But um, so we have to prune them all the time. And, and this is a, a vine that we uh, cut off just not that long ago, probably about two or three weeks ago. And you can see, um, how, how's, this, how's this branch doing? It's dead. It, it, it doesn't last. Because, and that's what Jesus said in John 15. He said, I am the vine, and you're the branches. If a man remains in me, connected to me, then you will bear much fruit. See, and this is really cool. And then he says, and it's to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. He goes, I want you to be connected to me. He goes, but if you don't remain in me, if you're cut off from me, if you're separate from me, then you don't have the life-giving source that is me. Okay? And so when I think about this, you guys, when I think about being separated from God as being separated from life, and, and Jesus using this example to say, you will bear much fruit if you stay connected to me. Well, see, that's what he says. I use this all the time here, but the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. That when the Spirit of God is living inside of you and helping you to be who you're really supposed to be, he says it's love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. Now, anybody in here not want that list? I mean, I mean if you really you're sitting here, man, oh, yeah, that love stuff. You know, joy, who wants joy? Peace. You know, I, no thanks. I love the conflict. You know, I love, I love the emptiness. You know, I love, no. I mean, what God is saying is, if you stay connected to me, I am going to give this to you and it's life. Then there's a few other things for me. When God, when, you, when I'm, my life is connected to him, he says, I'll give you wisdom. Anybody need wisdom? I mean, I'm telling you, every single day, I mean, if you're a parent, we need wisdom. We need wisdom in our marriages. You need wisdom in your workplace all the time. And God says, if you lack wisdom, come and ask me and I'll give it to you. See, but we got to be connected to him to receive it. Strength, just inner strength and power to be able to actually live the way that you want to live. God says, I will give you that strength. And then um, the other one, the big one for me, is his leading and his purpose. The Bible makes it really clear that every one of you sitting here today, that God has a purpose for your life. You were not created just haphazardly. It's not up to you just to get out there and go, hey, good luck finding why you're here. Jesus says, if you lose your life for me, you'll find it. I'm the good shepherd. I want to lead you into the reason and for the purpose for your life. But see, if you're separated from God, then you're left on your own to figure out what it is that's going to bring your own fulfillment and satisfaction and ultimately life-fulfilling purpose. But he says, if you connect yourself with me, I will reveal it to you. I will lead you into it, and I'll empower you to live it out. And this is great. See, this is what I want. 
Second Peter says that one of my favorite verses says, he says, we have everything that we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him. So my question is, do you know him? Do you know him? And then Jesus said this, he goes, and knowing me and knowing God is eternal life. This is eternal life, that you would know God. And so, but the, but the problem is, almost all of humanity, well, all of humanity at some point or another, walks separated from God through our own sin. Our own sinful nature says, you know what? I really want to do my own thing. And I don't care really. Actually, I know maybe you created me and all that kind of stuff, but I really want to be the ruler of my own life, and I, I want to worship my own desires instead of worship you. And when, when that happens, then it separates us from God. Sin inside of us does that to us. And last week, if you were here, how many of you were here, by the way? Let's just say, how many of you were at the park with us in Murray? Was that awesome? Man, I, I tell you, if you weren't there, uh, we're going to try to do it again in Labor Day weekend. But man, we had an unbelievable uh, Sunday last week outside at Murray Park. It was fantastic. But one of the things we talked about was the fact that there is, that we were made for the purpose. God says, God made you for this purpose so that you could live eternally with him. That's what we looked at last week, is the fact, what happens to us after we die? And God makes it really clear that you were made, you guys, not just for this life here on this planet. In fact, one of the things we talked about was that there are bodies, these bodies, once they die, he goes, last week we looked at, he calls them a tent. <laughs> because a tent was made to be assembled and then taken apart. He goes, but after you die, you are going to have a new body. See, we actually live after this life. And this is one of the things that, I can't go into last week's message, so, so just buy the, you know, get the CD, get on our website and listen to it. But one of the things we have to remember is when this life is over, what we're doing right now is creating our future existence. And so God says, I created you to have eternal life with me. But if you're separated from God, okay, if you're separated from him, you don't have eternal life within you. You are a finite being. And after this life is over, you are going to know, need to know that you have Christ, that you have the eternal life that he brings inside of you to take you in to the rest of eternity. That's huge. So here's what I want to share with you today, okay? No more separation. No more separation. This is what God is saying to you and me. Uh, the, the passage we're going to look through today, I feel like, for me, it's kind of the theme passage for K2, the church. Why do we exist as a church? I found myself going back to this verse over and over and over again. And I'm going to teach you three things. The first one we're going to camp on. The last two I'm just going to hit on. But there's three things in this passage. The first one is God says, no more separation. It is not acceptable to be a separate, separated from me. This is not what you were created for. <laughs> You were created to be in relationship with me. Second thing is, no more selfishness. And then the third thing, no more silence. Okay, so those are the three things we're going to look at today. No more separation, no more selfishness, and no more silence. Okay, so let, so let me pray. I want to pray. And, and here's what, I, here's what I want to ask you before I pray. Is again, uh, I don't know where many of you are in, in your spiritual journey. But this life that I'm going to share with you today, that we share every week, that we're supposed to have, created to be connected to God, to know him personally, and to have him literally dwelling within your being. If, if you don't know that yet, um, I just want to encourage you today. If you're seeking after or, or wondering about Christianity, or maybe not, maybe you came with a friend and you're just doing them a favor by being here today. I, I just want to encourage you about this. God says this. If you seek me, you'll find me. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. And if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. And I just want to encourage you today that if you would, while I'm praying, if you would just open up your heart and say, you know what, God? Just help me to understand. Because I, I just want to tell you something before I pray. This is, it was just hitting me this morning. This whole God thing and Christianity and all that is a, is a real mystery to me. It really is. Because I, I realize, as I'm going to share this with you this morning, that I can't convince you of anything. <laughs> I wish I could. 
I wish I had some magic power to be able to say, hey, I'm going to share this with you, and you're going to get it, <laughs> you know? And, but I can't. That's just not how it works. Somehow, what I'm going to share with you today, there's this mystery, and all of us who are in this room who are followers of Christ, you know that this happened one day, didn't it? You didn't get it, and then all of a sudden, one day, you got it. All of a sudden, one day, the light came on, and what was dark to you became light, and what didn't make sense to you made sense to you, and all of a sudden, you like, you know what, I, I really do believe, and you wanted to put your faith in God. <laughs> and, uh, and so I just, I just want to encourage you um, this morning that I feel like what we're going to do right here now, just in our prayer time, is if you'll open your heart to God, I think God wants to actually reveal it to you. And it's just a, a, it's a humbling thing that you have to do. Say, God, I, I just want to get to know you. And please help me to get it because I don't get it. <laughs> okay, so let's pray and let's ask God to do that. And if you are a follower of Christ, there's some major stuff in here for us too today. Okay, so, so let's pray together. Father, thanks for this glorious day outside. And thank you for drawing every one of us here today. Everyone in this white warehouse, everyone in the red warehouse, we just, we, everyone down south campus today. Um, Lord, I believe that we're here because you want us to be here. And that every person in this room matters to you. And I want to ask on their behalf, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, that, that you might open the eyes of our heart today so that we might understand so that we might see a spiritual reality that you've been trying to reveal to us. But God, we need your help. Naturally, we can't make sense of this. And so I really do pray that your Holy Spirit would come today and that you would make yourself real to all of us and speak to us so that we can leave this place knowing that we are connected to the living God and we have eternal life living inside of us right now with a security that we're going to have it forever. And Lord, I, I just, just have your way. Just do what you want to do with us, and I pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so here we go. Uh, no more separation, okay? So we're in chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, as we're going through this, uh, this passage. I'm going to kind of be jumping around in the verses here a little bit today. Uh, but they will also be up here on the screen if you don't have your Bible with us. Again, let me just say, I think this is a great series to actually have your Bible in here so you can mark it up and make little notes and, and connections. And if you don't have one, we always have free Bibles available at our information table. All right? Let me just start uh, in verse 11. It says, Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. We persuade men. Since we know what it is to fear the Lord, we persuade men. Now, if you weren't here last week, the verse right before that in verse 10 is when Paul said, all of us, every person is going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to receive what's due us, whether good or bad, for what we've done while we're here in the body. That's just, that is a killer deal. So what Paul was saying is, I know one thing. Every human being is going to stand before Jesus one day for how we lived our life. And he says, so man, since we know that, he goes, then this next verse, he says, we know what it is to fear the Lord. You know, because really, I mean, if you, if you ever went into a courtroom and you had to stand before a judge, it's just crazy, isn't it, to think that that judge has the authority to make a decision that's going to affect your fate. And there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, that, that provides a little healthy fear, doesn't it? Where you sit there and you go, okay. And that's really what's going to happen when we stand before Jesus one day. So Paul's saying, in light of the fact that all of you are going to stand in front of Jesus someday for the life you live down here, and he goes, and I am too, he goes, we actually have a fear of the Lord. Now, it's not a scare like, oh my gosh, then I want to run away from God. It actually causes you to come closer to him because you realize that this one who's the judge is also the one who loves you. Okay? So anyway, we persuade men. And then I want to go to verse 14, and it says, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all. Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all. Okay, I'm going to share with you today in this passage um, the, the, the greatest news in all the world. And here's the question. Why? Why did Christ die for all? See, if you know anything about Christianity, the heart and soul of our faith 
is based on the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Good Friday and Easter is what we're all about. God so loved the world that he sent his only one, one and only son into this world. And the reason he came was to die. Why? Why did he have to die? Well, here's why. In Romans, it says that the wages of sin is death. In other words, what he says, what God says is, here's the deal. What you earn by not loving me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, what you earn by not loving your neighbor as yourself, what you earn by committing adultery and by stealing and by lying and by all the Ten Commandments and everything else that we've all broken, haven't we? Anybody in here not broken any Ten Commandments? Okay, good. We're all in the same boat. So here's the point. He says what you earn for being sinful is death. Why? Why? He says this because we, we looked at this. He goes, what fellowship can light have with darkness? See, sin separates us from God. And when we, when we, when we sin, God in his perfection and in his holiness, you can't have dark and light at the same time. And so God says, when you sin, then I actually need to punish that sin. And the problem is the punishment is you are now separated from me. You're separated from me. Now, now we look at that and we go, wait a second. Now, what's, up, what's the big deal with God? Why does he have to do that? Well, again, all of us in this room, you want justice. I mean, if somebody murders somebody else on this planet, you don't go, hey, well, that's okay. Let's just forgive and forget. I mean, if somebody rapes somebody, you don't go, oh, you know, that's okay. Just don't worry about it. No, there needs to be justice for that. And the same thing is true with God. And so what God says is this, sin has to be paid for. It has to be paid for. And the wage, the payment, is death. Because you have now been broken off from me, and I'm life. So, what God is saying to you today is if you're separated from God, then not only do you not have him right now giving you everything you need for life, but you will not have the eternal life that's necessary for you once this life is over. So he says, man, you know what? No more separation. I need to bring you back to myself. So let me just take you to the Old Testament. You know, anybody ever here try to read the Old Testament and not get it? <laughs> Anybody, you know, one of, the, one of the worst things you can do is, 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 hey, when people start to read the Bible, they start at the beginning, because that's what we do, right? You start at the beginning, and most people read for like a few chapters and go, okay, I don't get this, and you close it and put it. Anybody else, anybody do that in here? Okay, almost everybody. Great. So but let, me, let me just give you a nutshell, because what God was doing in the Old Testament is he was trying to make sure that the Israelites would understand what Jesus Christ was all about. And what God did in the Old Testament is he said this. He goes, here's the deal. If you guys sin, then the payment for sin is death. So I don't want you to have to pay that. So what he did is he put together a sacrificial system where he would say, something needs to die because I'm a holy God and I must do justice. So something needs to die. And so what you'll find in the Old Testament is a sacrificial system where they could offer the life of another animal that would die in their place. It was a substitute. And therefore, God could, death had to happen, so he could cause the death to happen through a sacrifice. And in light of that, the person could be continued in a relationship with God. See, so now, what happened with Jesus Christ, you guys, is God sent Christ into the world to be our sacrifice, to be the one who would take on the punishment of God so that God could still be holy, so that he could still be just, and yet so he could offer forgiveness to the world. Look at this verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says this. God made him, meaning Jesus Christ, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Verse 21, it's, it's this amazing verse. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Right there in that verse is the nutshell of what we believe and why I love God with all of my heart and why I worship Jesus Christ. Let me give you a couple of illustrations of what this is like. It would be as if you were caught, um, oh, excuse me, caught in a vine and uh, no, it would be as if you were caught red-handed 
let's say you, let's say you, you killed somebody and you murdered someone right out in public. Everybody knew it. You walk into the courtroom. The sentence is given. The judge, everybody knows you're guilty. And he condemns you to your sentence. And it's life, a life sentence in prison. And you stand there. And you know you're guilty. And so you deserve that punishment. Well, here's what God did in Christ. What God did in Christ, it's almost like he, as the judge, he took off the robe, came off the bench as the judge, and comes down and he says, okay, I've already delivered the sentence. He goes, but now I'm going to live it out. And then he says, you're free to go because I'm going to live out the sentence. That is what Christ did for us. He goes, the punishment has to be delivered. But Jesus says, I'll take the punishment so that you can be free. There's another story, and I've shared it here before, but it's the best story that I've heard of what makes sense of what Jesus Christ did for us. How did God make him who had no sin to be sin for us? How did God put the punishment on Christ so that you and I don't have to experience the punishment? That's the question right there. And it's a story about, a, about an Indian chief. And this, this chief was dearly loved by the whole tribe. He was incredibly compassionate. He was very caring and very loving. But at the same time, he was very just. He had the rules, and he kept the law in order in that tribe the way that it needed to be done. And one day, there was a theft that had taken place in the tribe. And so he brought all the people together. And he said, okay, who, who's guilty of this crime? Who, who, took the, who, who stole this, this item? And nobody would, would step up and say that they had done it. The next day, so there was another theft. <laughs> so they bring everybody together, and they say, okay, please, whoever, made this, whoever committed this crime, please step forward. And no one would do it. Third day, another theft happens again. And this time, they're all gathered together, and the chief is standing there, and two of the warriors come in and because they found out they caught the person who had, who had actually stolen the item, and it was his mom. So they stand before the chief with, caught with his mom, and as they're standing there, the whole rest of the tribe is going, oh, my goodness, what's he going to do? Everybody knew he loved his mom. He's unbelievably compassionate. He's committed to her. But at the same time, they knew that he's very just, and he always stands up for the laws that he has created for this tribe. So what happens is the chief stands there, and he goes, all right, we need to administer the punishment, which was, again, the 40 lashes. And so the, the, the chiefs, uh, I mean, the, the, the warriors take his mom, they tie her wrists together around a pole, and they bear her back, and they get ready to administer the punishment. And as soon as they grab the whips and they get ready to do it, the chief goes, hold on. And he stops him, and he goes over, and he takes off his clothes. He wraps himself around his mom, holds on tight, and he says, administer the punishment. And then he took all the lashes that she deserved. And in that way, he satisfied both his justice and his love. You guys, when I first heard that story, I go, there's no better picture of what Jesus Christ did. When he was on the cross, what he did is he put himself over your guilt, over the condemnation that you and I deserve for our sin and for our rebellion against God. And God said, you know what? I am going to administer that punishment. And Jesus then said, then give it to me. And in that way, God satisfied his justice and his love for you. And that's when he says, no more separation. You have been reconciled to me. The forgiveness of your sins is completely offered to you. Look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verse 18. He says, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Let me read that again. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And then verse 19 that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. So you guys, what Jesus Christ did, what God did through Christ, is he's saying, you are separate from me, and that is not okay. I need to forgive you of your sins so that we can come back together. 
That's reconciliation. But how did he do it? He says, through Christ. God reconciled the whole world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. You guys, can I just tell you this? You don't want your sins counted against you. You don't want God's wrath towards sin to come on you because the wages for your sin is death. And if you want to pay that price, you will. Or you put your faith in Christ and you receive the forgiveness that's offered from God through Christ for you. And you receive the Holy Spirit of God inside your being. You are reconciled. You are now, he actually says, once I forgive you, then you and I can be together and I can live inside your heart every minute of every day. You guys, that's what every human being needs. This is why it's the greatest news in all the world. Because of my sin, because of your sin, Jesus was sent to the world and it's covered. It's unbelievable to me. And who did he do it for? It says God was reconciling the world to himself. In other words, all of you in this room, everybody out there, everybody in the whole world, the forgiveness for their sin is offered to him. But he says, be reconciled to God. You have to be reconciled to him. Okay, let me just explain this because this is really important. What he's saying is, I have reconciled the world to myself through Christ. But you need to somehow have some sort of response to that. You need to be reconciled reconciled. Let me, let me share with you how this happens. The best picture that's, that's helped me, and I've used this a few times here, is that it's almost, it's what the Bible teaches is that all of humanity is sin. All, all of us have. And our, our condemnation for our sin is death. So it's literally like we're sitting in a prison cell. And we've all been sentenced to death, to be separated from God for eternity. That's our, that's our state of humanity. When Jesus Christ came and when he died for your sin, it's as if he went over to the cell put the key in the lock, opened it up, and swung open the door and said, you are free. I have done everything that's necessary for you to be reconciled and brought back to God. But what most of humanity does is we sit in the cell and we go, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Either we don't believe that we actually have a sentence to death, which is probably most of the case, most of the case, or we don't believe that Jesus Christ is who he said he is or that his, his death on the cross was necessary. But here's the mystery, and I just, here's the mystery. Every person who's come to follow Christ at some point has been sitting in the cell and all of a sudden there will be godly sorrow for your sin. And all of a sudden you'll sit there and you go, you know what, you're right. I have lived and I am living a life against God. And when you hear this message, you will realize, man, you better have your sins forgiven if you're ever going to have the hope of being connected to God for eternity. But here's the good news. The door is open. Jesus already paid for it. There's no sacrifice needed left. He, he already is your sacrifice. He already is the Savior of the world. So what do you got to do? You simply have to agree with the sorrow inside your heart and say, you know what? I agree and I confess if you confess your sins, I confess my sin to God. And then it says, you repent, which means you turn and you engage with God. Now, here's what I think most people don't want to do it. You know why? Because if you're in this cell, to come out of the door means that you come in to Christ. If you confess your sins and come into Christ, you will be reconciled with God. And you guys, I'm telling you, what will happen is that Jesus Christ will enter into your life. But when he does, he does it as God. And that's why most of us don't want him, because we want to run our own life. <laughs> but once you humble yourself and receive his forgiveness, you also receive him. And that's eternal life, knowing God. It's taking two broken things, a relationship with God that's broken, and it's bringing it together. And when that happens, you guys, you will never be the same again. This dead vine will get connected to the branch, or yeah, no, the branch will get connected to the vine, and you will start to experience what we've been teaching here. 
the life transformation of becoming the man and the woman that God created you to be. And that's eternal life. And the other thing you'll know is when Christ is dwelling inside your heart, he says there is a guarantee of what is to come, and it's the Holy Spirit living inside of you. This is the greatest news in all the world. My sins are forgiven, and the Holy Spirit is dwelling within me now to help me be the man that God created me to be, and he guarantees me now eternal life into the future after I die to have a new body and a new hope for eternity. And in light of that, you know what Paul says? He goes, I implore you, which means a gentle persuasion. He goes, but I implore you, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. You guys, you do not want to end this life separated from him. And to be honest with you, you really don't want to live one more day <laughs> separated from God when he gives you the life that he has. No more separation. God has done everything that's necessary so we can know him and have him in our life. And again, what do you need to do? You simply need to confess your sin to God and receive his forgiveness through Christ. He reconciled you through Christ. Receive Christ into your life. And he forgives you and he indwells you as a spiritual being. And his spirit, the very spirit of God comes inside you to help you be the man and the woman you've created to be. There you go. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's what Christianity is all about. No more separation from God. None. You can be eternal with God forever. All right? Okay. Now, let me just say two quick things. Uh, the, my last two points are really quick. Let me just share these for all of you in this room who are already followers of Christ. You're a believer in Jesus. There's a couple things you need to know. The first one is this. Once you receive Christ in your life, in this passage, he says, no more selfishness. <laughs> okay? No more selfishness. Okay? Look at the verse here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. It says, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. He died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves. You guys, you know why the world is so screwed up? It's because we live for ourselves. If you, if you want to look at any marriage, any marital struggle, you know what's happening? Somehow, somebody in there, one or probably both parties, are living for themselves. Look at the conflict in the world. Why are there wars? Because we want our own thing. And so what Jesus said, he goes, I'm dying for you so that you will no longer live for yourself, but for me. And if you live for God, you know what you do? You love other people. You love other people. I'm telling you, this is the greatest news. He goes, in verse 17, he says, Therefore, if anyone's in, anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. You guys, again, what he was doing, when God reconciled you to himself, what he's doing is saying, now my spirit can be inside you. And my spirit is one that always lives for the other person. So if I died for you, and if you receive me into your life, you will no longer live for yourself. But you will live for me, and if you live for me, you will live to love the world. You guys, you see what, so what God is really doing is he's starting right now within the church, within those who believe in Christ, a group of people who are supposed to come into a tattered, broken, hurting, painful world with a new life. A life that's free from themselves and a life that brings blessing to all those around us. That's what the church is supposed to be. So I just got to tell you, ask you real quick, man, if you're a follower of Christ today, are you living for him? Because he died for you so that you wouldn't live for yourself anymore, but that you would live for him. So you just need to do a little internal deal and say, man, what is my life about? Do I wake up every morning and just think about me? If you do, then you're totally missing the point of why Jesus died for you. He died for you to set you free because sin at its core is simply living for yourself more than God and living for yourself more than others. That is sin at its core. And Jesus died to set you free from that. I'm telling you, you start living for God and start living for others, you know what's going to happen? You're going to experience blessing, man. People are going to start loving to be around you because <laughs> you're actually blessing them. You're thinking about them. You're doing things for the community. That's what God wants to do through us, okay? So no more selfishness. 
When there's no more separation, there's no more selfishness. And then the last thing, just really quick, is, and then there is no more silence. No more silence. Paul just says, since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We persuade men. This is why, K, I just want to tell you this, because this is why K2, the church, exists. And if you're a follower of Christ, this should be part of what you're about, is persuading men just to help them to know the reality of Christ. Verse 14, for Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all. His love compels us. See, I just got to tell you, like, this is why I, well, this is why I do what I do. Because in that word, compels us, it actually means to constrain you. It's like two walls. What Paul was saying is, he goes, I've got two walls. It's like, I can't go any other direction. I have to go this direction. What Paul was saying is, I have to love people. I have to let others know because Christ's love compels me to do it. Once you know how much God has forgiven you of your own sin, that love for you gets exuded to others. And then once he comes inside your heart, his love is inside you and it drives you to help others know him too. If you're a follower of Christ in here today, does his love compel you? Does it constrain you to live for others and to help others know that they too can be reconciled to God and have life eternal? It should. And then the last thing he says is this, and this is I'm done. He says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He has committed to us, to us, the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Is that not crazy? I think one of the most amazing things is for me and all of you who are followers of Christ in here is to remember, no more silence. We are Christ's ambassadors as if God was making his appeal through us to the rest of the world. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. You guys, the church, one guy said the church literally is the hope of the world because the church is who God uses to get his message out to the rest of the world that they're loved and that they're forgiven. And if they'll just put their faith in Christ, they can receive that forgiveness and receive eternal life. But the crazy thing is he wants to use us. Man, we can't be silent. Due to the fear of the Lord, due to his love, and due to the calling that he has on us. So there you go. No more silence, no more selfishness, because there's no more separation with God. All right, so Ben, why don't you guys come on up, and let's close. And here's what I want to ask you to do um, while we close here today. Um, in, in, in chapter 6, verse 2, Paul says, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor, and now is the day of salvation. Now is the time of God's favor. And now is the day of salvation. So um, the gals down here are bringing out uh, our communion. We're going to take communion uh, this morning. And if, uh, if you know anything about communion at all, what Jesus Christ did is right before he died, he was hanging around with his 12 disciples, and he said, listen, he goes, I know that you're going to have a hard time remembering me and remembering how important what I've done for you is. So here's what I want you to do. He goes, I want you to take this bread and I want you to remember that my body was broken for you. And maybe today, when you take the bread, you can picture the body of that chief coming around you, taking your punishment. That's what you should do when you hold that bread. And you say, Jesus, thank you for taking my punishment. And then you'll dip it in the juice. And Jesus said, this is also, this represents my blood for the forgiveness of all of your sin." See, it's important to know that Jesus had to die in your place because the price for sin is death. But he did it. And we are, what he wanted you to do today is to remember, when you put that in there, into that juice, you remember, Jesus has already paid for me. I'm forgiven and I'm clean. And you celebrate that. Now, for some of you today, I just, I just want to say that maybe today would be the first time that you might come down here. You've been sitting in the prison. You've been living for yourself. 
You've been separated from God. And today, he is telling you, if you'll just confess your sins to me and repent and turn and receive me into your life, you can be reconciled to God. You can be brought back into relationship with God. And if you want to do that today, then you can do that. Receive, just ask, say, that's it. Just, God, I confess my sin to you. Jesus, please come into you. I am going to come. I am going to follow you. I am going to reconcile my life and engage with you for the rest of my life and come down and take this. Now, for some of you as well, you just need to, those of you who are followers of Christ, today is your day as well to say, you know what? I, um, now is the day for me to live for him. And Jesus, I just got to confess to you, I haven't been living for you. I haven't. And you died for me so that I wouldn't live for myself but for you. If you're a follower of Christ today and you know you haven't been living for him, then today is your day to come down here and say, you know what, Jesus, confess your sin again to him and receive the forgiveness and the opportunity to walk out of here engaged with God.